Hello everyone, I'm George from Ireland. So I'm outside the house where the Earl of Rosebery was born uh, in 1847. So um, Earl Rosebery, the Earl of Rosebery rather, he was um, a Liberal Prime Minister. He only served for a year and three months, March 1894 to um, <coughs> June 1895. So um, he was heir to a Scots title. It, um, when he was four years old, his father died, and his grandfather, the Earl of Rosebery, that this chap um, uh, eventually inherited. So Archibald Philip Primrose was his name. Um, Rosebery was a title um, relating to a place in Scotland. Uh, then he had the courtesy um, uh, title Viscount Dalmeny, whilst he was awaiting to inherit the, the major title. So his mother um, later remarried, um, and she became the Duchess of Cleveland. And uh, Lord Rosebery, as he later became, he had a notoriously dysfunctional relationship um, with his mother, who went on to have more children with her second husband. Um, so uh, he went to prep school. He had a typical uh, aristocratic upbringing. Uh, then he went to Eton, where he was very close to one of his teachers, a Mr. Corrie, who was a sort of a father figure for him. They went on holiday to Italy together when he was 16, just the two of them, and oh, the mother approved. Now these days people would really frown upon that, I think there was something immoral about it. I've, I've no sense there was anything untoward about that, but in the 19th century that would have been considered completely acceptable and unsuspicious. Um, anyway, so uh, he had a distinguished career at Eton, and he went on to Oxford. Which college was he going to go to? Christchurch, of course, which was the grandest one of all. And so he was, he was a brilliant young man, a superb speaker. He cut a dash at the Oxford Union as the debating society of Oxford University. He was also very fond of the GGs. He hadn't spent that much time in London. He was often, uh, in his holidays, going to family estates of the countryside, and he purchased a horse, which is against proctorial regulations. Now, this is later discovered that he had a horse, and the proctors offered him a choice. He will sell that equine now, or he should be sent down. So he said he'd rather leave the university. He wasn't going to give up that, that horse. So he became a major figure in British horse racing for the rest of his life as an owner. I don't think he trained them. He said he wasn't a jockey. He was too big for that. He was not an especially big man, but he wasn't miniature as you need to be in order to be a jockey. So um, Lord Rosebery, he travelled extensively. He went to the United States, and in his early 20s, he, he proposed to a 16-year-old, um, but uh, she said no. There would have been considered nothing wrong with marrying him when she was 16 back then. Indeed, it's legal today, just it would be thought too young. Um, he was about 24 uh, at the time. Um, the, other, the other thing is, well, his family, I'm sure, would have objected because uh, yeah, she came from a fairly wealthy American family, but she was adopted. What were her origins? People were super snobby back then. But he was courted by both Gladstone and Disraeli to join their party. He eventually opted to join uh, the Liberal Party, so he got along well with William Ewart Gladstone. And um, his, uh, well, his, fa father's, his, fam his family on his father's side was from the Edinburgh area. His mother's side was mainly English. He had distinguished ancestors on both sides, particularly on his mother's side, the Stanhope side. One of his uh, one of his ancestors been a prominent minister under King George the um, First. So uh, he was a man with liberal views, as you would expect, having uh, castigated Charles the First. This is this is Lord Rosebery saying Charles the First was, was was tyrannical. Um, Anyway, uh, so he espoused the, the typical liberal views of the time, but as we'll see, he actually didn't keep, keep pace with the evolution of liberalism. Uh, anyway, um, he was there, there then in the House of Lords because his grandfather died. He inherited the title, the Earl of Rosebery. And he was a major figure in, in uh, liberal politics, partly because he was an outstanding rhetorician. Then he married a very wealthy um, uh, young lady who was a, uh, an orphan of the, 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 the Rothschild family. Well, she wasn't. Her father had died when she was in her teens. In her early 20s, they got married, and they got married very close to here. You can't actually see the church. Um, they got married, I think, in a registry, a registry office. I'm not quite sure why. She was Jewish, and as far as I know, she didn't actually convert to Christianity. You can't see it from here, but be the other side of that building, it would be Christ Church on Down Street. Um, is that they had a blessing rather than the formal marriage, but they were blessed with a race of two daughters and two sons. Um, so he inherited a lot of money from her, even though he was all, all, already um, affluent. Um, so he was making waves in liberal politics, held a number of, uh, number of cabinet posts, and was eventually 
foreign secretary. Uh, he recognised that um, France and Germany were, were the powers he really had to contend with. Some people in Great Britain really hadn't got their heads around the fact that, that Germany was very mighty and might even be considered a superpower, even though they didn't have that many overseas colonies and the Germans didn't want that many overseas colonies. That um, France was not in terminal decline, France was not necessarily opponent, but he um, rattled his sabre at France over various colonial disputes over Uganda and so on, and uh, he was um, an outspoken admirer of, of, of Napoleon. Napoleon's achievements, not so much his methods, not that like, Napoleon had an ideology, if anything he was a military dictator. That, that aspect of him, Rosebery did not admire, but uh, he thought that Napoleon was right on some things, that whoever controlled um, Egypt would control India. Now that wasn't true in Napoleon's time, there's no Suez Canal, but by Rosebery's time it was. So Rosebery was um, an outspoken imperialist and that was uncontroversial at the time. You might say, well that's the antithesis of liberalism, but they didn't think so back then. Um, so he was a foreign secretary for a while. He'd also been elected to London County Council uh, because all the boroughs of London, there'd been 82 of them, were slimmed down to 32. And then, no, there were 85, slimmed down to 32. And then there was a London County Council, equivalent of the London Assembly today, to try and handle matters for the whole of London. Because what about water? What about gas? What about electricity? By the late 19th century, you needed to coordinate on these things. And public transport, you couldn't have 85 boroughs all doing their own thing, or even 32 boroughs all doing their own thing. They had to cooperate. Um, so he was eventually chairman of, of, of London County Council. We now have a mayor of London, but that was as close to the mayor of London as, as existed at the time, so into local government. So even though he was in North Britain, he spent almost all his time in uh, South Britain. Um, anyway, so he was in, he, he stayed with Gladstone this, over the split about Irish home rule, which is quite surprising because quite a few liberals of his ilk became liberal unionists, were in alliance with the, with the um, Conservatives and, and eventually merged into the Conservative Party around the time of the First World War, but not Lord Rosebery. Um, so uh, Gladstone stood down in 1894. He was very old. He was 85 at that stage and increasingly frail. And Lord Rosebery, he was um, invited to kiss hands, that, as in when the Queen appointed him Prime Minister. Nothing is signed, um, just uh, that action. But they say the, the Prime Minister has very lightly brushed her hands with his lips, that's the kissing hands, and then he is Prime Minister. So he was first Lord of the Treasury, and one of the difficult things he's faced was, in the Ottoman Empire, a large-scale massacre of Armenians, should, should uh, the United Kingdom intervene, trying to cobble together a coalition the willing, but it wasn't to be. The Tories were quite um, uh, Turkophile, the, Ottoman, the Liberals were more Helen, Helenophile, um, or Phil Helene, I should say. And uh, saying, you know, this won't do. Bulgarian horror, uh, the Bulgarian horrors, and the question of the East. He'd been instrumental in the Midlothian campaign in 1879, which had catapulted uh, Gladstone back to prominence. A lot of people considered that Gladstone's career was over before that happened, when there was an, a rebellion in Bulgaria, an Ottoman, an Ottoman uh, territory, and the the Ottoman army. Um, and killed tens of thousands of Bulgarian civilians. I know no army is perfect. Most armies have committed atrocities. They're always unacceptable. Got to be realistic. Sometimes soldiers will do this. They often behave badly in a counterinsurgency. But even taking that into account, the Ottoman army just behaved egregiously badly. It wasn't once or twice, and these weren't small scale. And the Ottoman government knew precisely what was going on and made no attempt to stop it. Um, but uh, anyway, no other countries were forthcoming. No one was going to help the United Kingdom fight the Ottoman Empire. They decided that discretion was the better part of valor. The other thing is the, Ot the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire was the Caliph, supposedly the successor to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him, the Khalifa. And the deal was the British would be supportive of the Ottoman Empire and the return of sublime port would tell Mohammedans throughout the Britannic domains to be obedient to the British authorities. Um, so far, so good. As we'll see, that that was put to the test in the First World War when the UK and, and, and the Ottoman Empire went to war against each other and the Caliph, he proclaimed jihad, but very few Muslims responded to this fatwa. So his, his influence over Sunni Muslims was much less than had been imagined. Um, anyway, so that, that was a damp squib. And then there was a vote over military spending, which they narrowly lost by seven votes. Now, Rosemary could have said, oh well, the, the, the Secretary of State for War, Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman, he must carry the can, he's got to resign. But no, he said, well, we've lost a vote of confidence, so therefore we must go to the country. Um, well, sorry, sorry, he, he said, no, I, I'm not going to the country yet. Um, he'll resign as Prime Minister and his last act to advise the Queen to send for the Marquess of Salisbury, that's the Conservative leader, as the new Prime Minister, which she did. Now, Lord Salisbury promptly um, asked for a dissolution of Parliament, i.e. so there'll be a general election, and there was, and the Tories romped home. 
So that was the end of Rosebery's political career. He was in the House of Lords till the day he died, but uh, he eventually became a crossbencher, became increasingly alienated from the, from the Liberal Party. He didn't like this new liberalism. He was sort of the last Gladstonian, a more interventionist sort of liberalism, uh, a semi-socialist sort of liberalism. He disliked the people's budget. Uh, he spoke out against it, but he didn't cast a vote against it. He didn't like the Parliament Act and so on. So um, it was going too far for him just paving the, the, the way for the Labour Party, really. Um, but he loudly spoke up for the national cause during the First World War, fairly popular um, figure. His controversies had faded. During the South African War, he said, no, 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 we must fight on. And he disliked the so-called Little Englanders within the Liberal Party, as in those who were anti-imperialist. Um, and he, was, he unveiled a statue to Gladstone in Edinburgh in, in 1916, because he was, a, he was an elder statesman by that stage. So he um, had instructed his manservant when, when um, death was drawing near, whenever it's blatant he's about to die, on the gramophone, you must play the Eton boating song. Jolly boating weather and a hay harvest breeze, blade on the feather, shade off the trees. Swing, swing together with your bodies between your knees. So as life ebbed away, he heard um, that melody, which presumably brought him back to the joyous and carefree days of his youth, sporting beside the River Thames. So he, rem he remained immensely uh, attached to Eton until his dying day. And he, there's a lower, Rosebery Lower Boy History Prize, which I entered twice. Um, I can't even remember. Did I win it or did I come runner-up so long ago? Maybe I was Proxima Akesit. And I always assumed that he was the one who set that up. I'm not actually certain that that's true. Um, so that is um, uh, Lord Brit Rosebery, a fascinating um, political figure who's largely forgotten these days. Here in Mayfair, London, not Chesterfield Street, which street is he on? Charles Street, where he's born. He's buried um, at Dalmeny, just outside Edinburgh. There's his title related to that place. Toodaloo.